You're listening to the Woman of Value podcast. You are about to hear the story of a woman who is following her dreams and passions and creating positive change in the world. My guest today is Fran Hauser. She is a startup investor. She is the best selling author of The Myth of the Nice Girl Achieving a Career You Love Without Becoming a Person You Hate. She's also a career advice columnist at Refinery 29. And she speaks on women's leadership. She is the former president of digital at Time Inc. Welcome to the show, Fran. Hi, Sandy. Thanks for having me. I met you at a women's um, entre- entrepreneurial women's networking event, and we happened to walk in together. And you were so low key and humble that <laughs> you didn't say like I'm the speaker here today. You were like, yeah, I've never been here before either. And we were just kind <laughs> of like chatting. And I'm thinking. She's the freaking speaker today. So I, I <laughs> right away, I loved you for that, that you were just so, you know, just comfortable with yourself and you didn't need to brag or put it out there in any big way. And I think that's, to me, one of the signs of somebody who's really just comfortable with, with who they are, has their ego in check. And I know that a lot of the work you do is really about giving to others. Well, let's start with what is woman of value to you? Because I always like to start there. Well, so thank you, by the way. I, I <laughs> love, love that introduction. And I remember that um, walking in with you. So it was fun. Um, so, you know, being a woman of value to me is really all about making an impact and giving is a big part of that. You know, you mentioned giving. Um, it's making an impact while staying true to who you are. And I think both of those things are really important. I think that when you are doing work that's not aligned with your values, that's not aligned with who you are, it can be very depleting. And I really pay attention to that. I really pay attention to what is depleting me and what is energizing me. That, that's how I would define, to define a woman of value. It's somebody who's giving, who's making a positive impact. Um, it could be to to a group of people, you know, it could be to to people that she loves, it could be to the world at large, it could be to a professional, you know, organization or initiative, but it's really about impact at the end of the day and doing it in a way that is, that is authentic to who you are. I love that. I think that so many people are living out of alignment. They really don't even know where to start. And I know that you've been through many career shifts and changes. So how do you tune in to knowing, like, is this feeling right for me? Am I ready for a change? Or is it just something that I need to align more within the career that I have today? It really, I think it's just really important to pay attention to where you are in your life and what are the things that are really important to you and and designing a life that makes it all work or at least makes it work as you know as best as you can right nothing is ever perfect but i remember you know when i was at time inc i was an executive i'd been there for 10 years and my boys were really young at the time they were three years old and you know 18 months old and i felt out of alignment i felt like i wasn't spending enough time with them i had this crazy commute into the city And I wanted to make a change. I felt like it was really important for me to create a professional life that was more flexible so that I had time to be with the boys. And it it was a hard thing to do, right? Because um, I was very grateful for the role that I was in and the amazing brands that I was working with and the people that I was working with and all of that. I mean, it it was amazing but it just wasn't working for me given where I was in my life, you know, in that moment. And so I started thinking about like, okay, so how do I do this? How do I create flexibility? And I felt like, well, if I work for myself, that's definitely, um, you know, a way to have more flexibility, but what would I do if I, if I went out on my own? And then I started thinking about um, really the, the strong network that I had built in the New York city tech scene, because I was president of digital at Time Inc. So a lot of what I did was meet with startups, meet with founders. And inevitably what would end up happening, you know, in these meetings is founders would ask me for my advice about their business, about their products. 
and they wanted to get me personally involved in some way in their startup. So I kind of thought like, why don't I just do that? Why don't I, you know, as a side hustle, while I was a time bank, I started investing in and advising startups and I really liked it. And I decided that that's what I should be spending, you know, really my energy and my, and my time I'm doing. And it's something that I can do from anywhere. And um, so that's what I did. I guess it was six years ago now. I decided to leave the company and, um, and, and go, to, go to work, you know, um, for myself. And I love it. You know, I, I really, really do. I, I love um, being able to choose the, the companies that I get involved with, the founders that I work with, the projects, you know, and initiatives that I get to work on. So I feel like it's such a, a blessing that I, I have the freedom to choose um, who I work with and, and what I work on. And I have this time to actually be with, you know, my family and spend quality time with them. Yeah, you may don't get that back. <laughs> you don't. And it just goes so fast. I mean, they're already seven and nine. And um, my mother the other day is like, oh my God, like my, my oldest, you know, who's nine, she's like, he's halfway to, to college. I'm like, wait, stop. <laughs> Slow it down. He's going into fourth grade. I'm like, <laughs> let's relax there. <laughs> yeah. right? But it's just, it's crazy. I was just thinking, I'm like, you know, they just finished school and summer started, campus started. And like, before you know it, it's going to be the end of the summer, right? We have like six weeks left. So time does really just go so fast. And, um, you know, my husband and I worked so hard to have a family and it's not something that came easy um, to, you know, to us. So now that we have this beautiful family, it's like, okay, let's, let's enjoy it. Yeah, totally hear you on that. And I, and I remember you were talking, I, I just, I have my grandkids here. Um, they, they live in Israel. And so I have been making time every day within my work schedule to see them. So I can totally relate to what you're saying, like just making time for the people that matter and the things that matter, which yeah. brings me to something you talked about when I heard you about how you decide where you're putting your energy. Cause you mentioned about like doing things that don't deplete you, but, but fill you up, expand you. Mm -hmm. And so can you share that method with us? I really loved it. Yeah, so it's um it's something that I call the the four square. And I created this tool when I was coming back to work at Time Inc. from my second maternity leave. And I was just feeling really overwhelmed and I was also feeling very vulnerable. I um I I felt like I had to say yes to everything at work because I wanted to prove that I could do it all. You know, like I have these two kids, I have these two babies at home and yes, I can still like get, you know, all of this work done. Um, and of course it just, it, it, it wasn't working for me. Um, and so I decided I really had to take a step back and think about what are the areas of my life where I really want to focus my, my time and energy, the areas that are really important. Um, to me and then within each of those areas what are the priorities or the big rocks that i i wanted to kind of tackle and so the reason i called it a four square is because if you could picture four quadrants i came up with the four areas so um my areas still are after you know all those years me family career and world those are really the four big areas and by the way, those might sound obvious, but they can really be different based based on where you are in your life. It could be school instead of career. It could be travel instead of family, right? It's wh whatever those four areas are for you. And then within each one, I decided to choose no more than three priorities. Um, and then really, like when I look at this, when I look at the four square, the idea is that the majority of my time, like say 80% of my time is spent on these things, and of course, there's always time that you have to leave for other stuff, right? For administrative stuff, for stuff that just comes up. But um, it's a tool that I've been using for, for years now. And the thing that's really important about it is that once a week, usually it's on the weekend or on Friday night, I look at my calendar for the upcoming week. And I also look at my to-do list because that's where I'm actually spending my time, right? It's to-do list and calendar. Um, and I, I look for alignment between those things and my four square. And if there is an alignment, then I know I need to do something. So it's that discipline that I think is really um, just as important as, as identifying what your priorities are. Um, 
And I'll give you an example, like with, for, so for world, my world quadrant, that's really all the nonprofit work, the social impact work that I do. And at that time, what I realized was that I was on like six or seven um, host committees for fundraisers and which is ridiculous, I know, but I was. And I decided that I really had to be focused about where I wanted to spend my time and energy in the world at large. And that's when I decided it, it was women. I, I was really gonna focus on, on women. And it made it very easy to say no to any inbox requests that came in for initiatives outside of women's initiatives, right? Like that was just like a very clear, like I've decided to spend my time here. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, does that answer your question? Like part of it is like really being um, intentional and strategic about where you're going to spend your time. And then it's that discipline of, you know, every single week kind of looking at, okay, where am I actually spending my time? Where do I want to be spending my time? And if it's off kind of looking at that and evaluating it and deciding do you know maybe maybe this really isn't a priority i thought it was a priority but maybe it isn't because i'm it's been like six weeks and i haven't gotten to it um or it's moving stuff around and creating time on your on your calendar and on your to-do list yeah no so important to clarify what's important to you first and then feed every decision through those quadrants which is super clear and most people who are Feeling depleted, I have noticed, are not, they're not in alignment. They are saying yes to things that don't, that don't light them up, that don't make them happy, don't bring them joy. And they're doing things out of obligation and not out of choice. Mm. And getting that clarity first is hard for a lot of people. I mean, it's something that, I've, that I spend a lot of time in coaching on, either through my dating and relationship work or my work with corporate clients. You've got to be clear. What's your why? What, what, what is motivating you to do anything in life? And when you have that, then you're, not, you're unapologetic for the things that matter to you. I mean, I think we, we apologize as women yeah. way too much. Once you're clear on where you want to invest your time and, and, and your energy, um, it's, it's really important to not feel a sense of obligation to say yes. Like, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. I know I wrote about it in the book and the book came out over a year ago. And there are still times that I struggle with this. Like this literally has just been happening again, like over the last month where people who I really respect and admire will reach out to me asking if I can meet a female founder in their world who wants to pitch me their, their business. And my automatic instinct is to say, yes. But then when I take a step back and I look at the business and I realize it's not in my sweet spot, there's no way that I'm going to make an investment in this company. Um, it, it just, it doesn't, I don't want to waste the founder's time, right? And I don't want to waste my time. And I have literally had to just, like, I start writing the email saying, sure, go ahead and introduce me. And then I, and then I have to delete. And usually I just sit with it for a little bit and then I'll go back and, you know, and actually write a very kind, thoughtful response on why I am passing on, on the introduction. Um, but it, but I, I bring that up because I just think it's something we all do. Like it's that people pleasing. Part of it is people pleasing. Part of it is when you're very generous and you're giving, you know, you, you want to say yes, you want to be helpful. Um, and it's, it's so important to think about, like, in that situation, I would be spending an hour of my time, at least, because I would have to review the pitch deck, right? Even if it's a 30-minute phone call, I'd have to review the pitch deck. That's an hour. That's significant. Yes. So just don't feel obligated, I guess, is my message there. Don't feel that you have to say yes, because you don't. You really, truly don't. It's your time. And especially for people like you and me, like you're, you know, you're coaching, like time is money for you. Right. And I'm sure a lot of people reach out and would love to get advice from you. Right. And I'm, I'm actually, I'd love to ask you, I'm going to turn the tables here, but <laughs> right. That, that must be difficult though. Like for you to say no in those situations when you really do want to be helpful, but 
at the same time, you want to set boundaries. Correct. So boundaries are huge. I teach a whole course on boundaries. Uh, <laughs> the, the auto yes is really a problem. So I, I love what you said, first of all, about taking time. Um, that is really, really crucial if you want to stop the auto yes. Just process it because it's, it's a waste of your time and their time. So it's it also knowing that saying no to the right things is kind to yourself and kind to others. So it's part of being the nice girl of really being kind to yourself first. And I, I love that one of your quadrants is me because we have to take care of me first. So this goes back to the alignment with your core values. I know my core values. I know who I want to work with. I know who I work best with. And so if somebody reaches out to me and says, I want to work with you and they're not in my demographic and, or they're not really an open-minded person who really would benefit from coaching, then I'll say I'm not the right person for you. Sometimes I'll recommend somebody else. Um, I was just talking to an accountability partner of mine that we, we speak once a week and we, we set goals and keep them. And she was asked to be on a summit an online summit as an expert. And she goes, I don't really feel it. Uh, but what do you, how, do you, how do you measure if it's the right thing to do or not? So we went through the process that I go through. I've been on a lot of summits and some of them have been awful and some of them have been amazing. So now I know I need certain things in place. I need to know that this person has a success rate already. Uh, who are they going to have as their heavy hitters so that I know the email list will be huge and it will benefit my practice? Are they working with an assistant so that it's going to be professional and not just some shoddy thrown together thing on YouTube that nobody's going to see my free gift, nobody's going to sign up for anything on my, on my site? And so I shared with her how I do that. And, um, and then as we were exploring, it turned out it, this person is not aligned with her ideal client was not going to work. And so we discussed how to say no. And she's gotten screwed over many times by not asking enough questions up front. And I think that's also important. We have to know what we want and then we have to be able to ask. So. I agree with that. And I, I love the going back to the online summit thing just for a second. What I really like is that because you've done a bunch of these, right? And you've seen the ones that have worked, you've seen the ones that haven't worked for your, in terms of converting for your business, you now have sort of criteria or a process that you go through to evaluate whether you say yes or no. And I love process. Like I'm such a process person and it just, it makes me feel um, just, I don't know, I guess it gives me more confidence also. If, if I know that I've been through this before, I now have a process in place to vet the opportunity and and really trusting the process um, I just feel like it just saves so much time right so I love that and I that's such I think that's such great advice that we can apply to a lot of different things really in, in our in our lives um, so yeah so I just wanted to mention that before, oh, before I forget it thank you um, yeah I love process too <laughs> I love systems I love process and I think that the problems arise when you don't learn from your mistakes and uh, I had a guy reach out to me a couple years ago who had lost his job and was looking to build his own business and he knew that I had run my own business for many years and he said can I pick your brain so we have the pick your brain um, discussion I just love to run this by you so in the past, I used to say yes to things like this and then be resentful that I gave my time and, and it wasn't a lie, right? <laughs> so with him, I was really proud of myself and I took a step back and I said, it sounds like what you're looking for is a consultation. Here's my hourly rate. I'd be happy to meet you for an hour or however long you need me. And he hired me. And I was like, score. <laughs> I love, I love, it sounds like what you're looking for is a consultation. I yeah. love that. Yeah. I love that. I know. Cause it's, we, we just get asked all the time, right? Like, can I pick your brain? And um, especially once my book came out last year, the, the level and the number of kind of inbound requests that I get for my time, um, it's just exponentially increased. And that's what I've really been kind of um, doing a lot of 
work around kind of what do I say no no to, what do I say yes to, um, just trying to be really strategic and thoughtful and intentional about, about that um, and really placing a value on my time has become very, very important to me um, because otherwise I was going through the same thing. I was starting to feel resentful at the end of last year. I was starting to feel like, wait a second, I'm just like giving away my time giving away my time for free left and right and it doesn't feel good it really doesn't feel good so because of that you know I was able to create some webinars and um, some you know workshops and you know intimate kind of in-person workshops and I do do some one-on-one coaching I don't do a lot of it but you know I, I, will, I will do some of that if I'm really feeling it um, so really being able to kind of take a step back and look at, okay, what is the advice that I'm consistently being asked for, right? And for me, it fell into three categories. It was you know, career advice, um, founders looking for fundraising advice, and aspiring authors who wanted to get their book published. And so looking at those three different segments, you know, audience segments, it's, it was really thinking about, okay, how do I come up with products for each of those? And that's what I spent, you know, the beginning part of this year doing and I and I've launched all those products and is now it just feels great too because when I respond to people who reach out to me through LinkedIn or through my website or at least I have different ways that they can engage with me and it's not just a no right a kind no but um, so that that's actually been a great kind of like aha moment for me this year yeah and that's a system and a system. another right and it's a great use of your time. I think um, that's wonderful that you did that. There are a lot of people who are trading hours for dollars or giving away their time for nothing. And I think when you step back and say, what do I value about myself and about what I, the gifts that I have to give others? And how can I create an impact without giving away all my time and being depleted? And I, I think that's just fantastic. Um, I've coached a lot of women to do what you did. Oh, uh, good. That yeah. makes me feel good. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I'm working with a therapist right now who is only doing one-on-one therapy and teaching in a college. And so we're working on group programs and products so that she can reach more people and have also a, a smaller niche because she realized that she loves to do one particular type of work. And so then she now knows these are the people I want to work with. And again, that's really honing in on who are you? What do you do best? What lights you up? What drains the hell out of you? Yeah. Um, So she gave up some of the work that she hated also in the process. So good. Yeah. Um, So there's so many things in your book that I would love to talk to you about. Um, Some are just, you know, sharing some stories about how you learn to show up more at work and how to how to how to use your voice or find your voice i would love to hear some examples of that and i love how you also just give so many concrete practical tips oh good that that was important that was really important to me is i you know i wanted um i wanted the book to have a lot of practical takeaways like at the end of each chapter there's the the takeaway section um, my editor was really amazing to work with. He, he was the one who um, just really encouraged me to be vulnerable as I was writing the book and to really share all different kinds of stories, you know, including stories where, you know, maybe if I could go back in time, I would have done things differently or learning moments, failures, whatever you want to call them. I mean, he, um, if it weren't for him, I think the book would have been much more of a playbook and, and much more tactical um whereas he kind of made it more of a it's like a memoir slash big think book slash like there are the practical takeaways right so the the speaking up and showing up i think my favorite story is um when i was first working at ernst and young and i was in my early 20s and coca-cola was a client and you know we spent a lot of time as a team um, Ernst and Young, we spent a lot of time there at the Coca-Cola offices, and we would be um, in this this boardroom where we'd be meeting with the Coke team, and there was a VP who, you know, he was an older man, you know, much more experienced, and he just scared the crap out of me, and at, 
I just had such a hard time speaking when he was in the room. And all I could muster to say was, that's interesting. Like just a total like noncommittal throw away. Like, oh, that's interesting. Like we could have been talking about what we're going to have for lunch. And that would have been my response. And this one day we walked out of, out of one of these meetings and my mentor and, and boss, Lou Sharetta, pulled me to the side and said, Fran, you have to stop doing that. You know, you have, you have to stop with the, that's interesting. Like you, you're smart. You have, um, you have points of view, you have, you have opinions and you should be sharing them in these meetings. It's really important that you do that. And I knew that he was right. And at the same time I was scared, but what I did um, in advance of the next meeting was I looked at the agenda and I picked one thing that I felt really confident about. And I practiced what I was going to say. And I just really committed that I was going to make at least this one point in the meeting. Um, and I did. You know, the, the meeting came. I spoke up. And, you know, I didn't die. Nobody laughed at me. Like, it was fine. It ended up being totally fine. And what I realized was the more that I did that, the more comfortable I got doing it. And um, I ended up developing such a great relationship with this man from Coke, um, the guy who was, like, really scary, the scary guy. And he ended up actually hiring me away from Ernst & Young to go to work for him on his team. And I, I think about that story often because if I hadn't spoken up, if I had not shared my, my points of view, I would have just continued to be invisible. And I never would have developed a relationship with this person, you know? I mean, so for me, that was a very important moment. And I think there's a lot that you could take away from that. There's some mentoring stuff. The fact that my boss actually took the time um, to, to have that moment with me, um, to call out what I was doing, you know, and to give me some advice on what to do. Um, the practical tip of like, if you are really nervous going into a meeting, make a commitment to yourself that you're going to talk about one thing and practice because the more you practice, the more confident you'll be. Um, but I can't tell you enough. I just transitioning from that into a leader and, you know, leading many teams and being in so many meetings where women aren't speaking up and they're not sharing their opinions. And for me, it was very important that, um, that, that I noticed that and that I was very aware of that and that I did something about it. You know, like there was this young, one young woman at People magazine that worked for me where I would give her a heads up before the meeting, I would say, look, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to talk about this because you are the expert. So I'm going to call on you. I just want you to be prepared. Right? So even if you don't have an issue with speaking up, if you're confident, if you're gregarious, always looking around the room and seeing like, is there somebody who is struggling and can you help them? Can you help really draw them out? Um, it's just, it's, it's so important. It's if you want to be seen, if you want to be visible, if you want to be noticed, if you want to develop, you know, a really strong reputation and accelerate professionally, you have to use your voice. You just have to. I love that story. And it speaks to me on many levels. I, I love that, first of all, that this mentor reached out in a way that was helping you to rise up to your highest level. He didn't do it to shame you. He didn't do it to reprimand you. He saw the highest part of you and wanted to bring it out. And that is an important part of mentorship. It's really about supporting somebody to grow into who they really are rather than hide who they are and uh, out of fear. <clears throat> so that's, that's something that I find really, really important and I wanted to highlight that. And I think also the preparation part. I think a lot of people think that um, it either comes naturally to you or you can't do it. And I can tell you that I was not a leader. I was not a speaker. I was invisible most of my life. And I wanted to fight at, to get out of that box so much, but I didn't know how for a long time. And so using my voice, a lot of times I wasn't heard. I was put down. I was shut down, shut up. And I realized that, first of all, it's also when you're around the wrong people trying to speak up, you're going to get shut down. So it's finding your people, which takes us back to the core values and the essence of who you are. And the other part I noticed 
about this whole story is that you now have taken what you learned and you teach it and you give back. And again, we go back to giving, which is a big part of your core values. So it's, it's a beautiful cycle of, you know, to pay it forward, to take what you learn and pass it down. Mm. Thank you. And I, I, I really loved that about the book, like the, the idea that I could um, scale really the, the advice right? The, the giving of advice. Um, it was so rewarding, you know, to actually write the book, to actually sit down and write it. And, and by the way, be surrounded, going back to your point, being surrounded by people who are my people, you know, who, who whether it was my writing partner or the two editors that I had, or even like my marketing team, like the people that were helping me think about how to launch the book, you know, into the world. Um, it was such a beautiful process, really, and um, it's just a process that I'm, I'm truly, I'm truly grateful for. And I love, I love the output. I, I love what we were able to, you know. Even I think about my writing partner; she asked me the best questions. You know, like I, I think a lot of the content that's in the book, if she hadn't asked me the right questions, I don't know if I would have even thought to include some of the stories in the book. So that just goes back to the importance of working with the right people that are going to bring out the best in you. Yeah, getting support. But also, I love your gratitude. I think a lot of people don't focus on gratitude enough. And you have this open, generous heart. And I can yeah. see it in so many parts of what we're talking about today. Thank you for saying that. You're welcome. Uh, so something else, in the, oh, and you mentioned vulnerability, which is, I love it. Um, <laughs> I think that often when we write, we write from our head and we don't bring our heart along. And the parts that really touch us, the stories, the, the I made this mistake kind of sharing are what really draw us in because we're drawn to humanity. We're not drawn to perfection. And unfortunately, most successful people have a perfectionist way of looking at their lives and um and it really stops them from reaching their highest potential yeah. yeah it's it's something i know i've definitely struggled with especially earlier on in my career i did feel that i had to have all the answers and i had to have it all figured out and you know i even just something as simple as going into a meeting with my boss um I really felt that I need I needed to have it, you know, the idea like perfectly fleshed out and presented in a beautiful PowerPoint deck, tied up in a bow, you know. <laughs> and it, it it after a while, what you realize is that actually your boss wants to be a part of the process and be a part of the the ideating and the conversation, and and they, they have so much you know value to add. So it's okay to not have it all figured out. It's okay to go into a conversation with your manager where you're asking them for their input on certain things. You know, maybe you're sharing your perspective and your insights, but you're also asking them for theirs. And then they really feel like they're, they're a part of it. They're, they're a part of the birth of whatever it is that you're working on, the product, the initiative, the process. Um, so I, I, I do think letting people in you know, let, letting, um, letting people in and being clear that you don't have it all figured out. It, it actually, you know, I've worked with people over the years where they, they're like the smartest kid in fifth grade, where they have all the answers and it's not comfortable. It doesn't make me feel good to work with those people. It really doesn't. I would rather work with people that are down to earth and acknowledge when they don't know something and maybe even, you know, use humor. And those are people that are, I don't know. They're just, they're real. They're grounded. They're, um, they create a psychologically safe environment. You know, we, I, I talk a lot about that in the book too, this idea of how important it is as a leader when you have a team of people that you're creating an environment where people are comfortable to speak up. And a big part of that is being clear with your team on, you know, the fact that you're welcoming diverse perspectives. You want to hear different points of view. You want to see a healthy and respectful debate. Um, that's all going to really feed into 
whatever it is that you're working on as a team. It's just going to make it better. Um, so I think that's also, it's, it's hard, it's hard to create a psychologically safe environment when there's this sheen of perfection. It just doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work in any relationship. And, you know, I'm thinking about parenting. I'm thinking about the pivotal moment when I stopped trying to be the forceful leader in my family with my kids. And I started to really listen to my kids and what their needs were and really value who they were as people, even at a very young age. And I, and I think it's, you know, I just keep hearing collaboration, um, leadership, you know, and this brings me back to the, the myth of the nice girl. I don't respect leaders who have to dominate. I don't respect leaders who don't include the team in the process. And I've had <clears throat> everyone from, you know, doctors who have to be right. I was kicked out of a practice because I, I was challenging a doctor who was one of the partners and I was in the middle of a crisis and he kicked me to the curb and they sent me my files and said, sorry, we don't want you in our practice anymore. <laughs> <laughs> go find another doctor. And I was just like, because I asked, I didn't want him to do the procedure that he wanted to do because of the way he was diminishing my needs. And so I'm glad I spoke up. Um, he was not the right doctor for me. But that kind of, if I can't be respected unconditionally, is just not going to work. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think, I think having that feeling of like, Again, we go back to the ego thing, and I and and this is something I noticed about you from the way you walked in the door at that networking event. It's not about ego; it's about there's a higher purpose, and I'm here to serve. I'm here to share my wisdom with other people, but I, I don't need to be lauded, and you know that's not the purpose. And and that's really what held me back from public speaking for a long time because I felt like. As a public speaker, you have to be in the spotlight and it's all about you, but it's really not. So. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that, by the way. That's something that really resonates with me in terms of the whole public speaking thing. It's, um, I'm actually so much more comfortable being in the background. I've, I've always been more comfortable being a producer as opposed to being talent. And I've had to be talent, especially over the last year. I've you know, I've, I've done so many of these talks and I've spoken at conferences in front of 2000 women, um, you know, and, and it's, it's something that I've had to really change my, my mindset around because otherwise it just wasn't working for me. Like it, I really had to think about it more from the standpoint of what you just said, which is it's service and it's not bragging. It's not, um, because I, I just, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. If it goes into like bragging and, and ego and first of all, I'm not a big personality. That's not who I am. I'm not, I'm never going to be Tony Robbins. I'm not the big, like, you know, motivational speaker. I, I am more soft-spoken. I, I, um, and I am more of the person that's going to be about you know, sharing my story, but really sharing some practical takeaways. I always want people to feel like they can leave the room with three things that they can do like immediately, you know, to, to make their life better. Um, so I am more that person. And I think once I decided to own it and to really be myself on stage and not try to be this person that I'm not, um, it just, it made the whole public speaking thing much more just manageable, comfortable, doable for me but but I had to it, it took me quite a bit of time to really get my head wrapped around it for sure uh, yeah I can relate <laughs> I was married to a performer and he was a um, professional comedian he had we had a show on Nickelodeon for three years together and I was always the background person I was one of the head writers I did editing and I big picture stuff but I never wanted to be talent. It was, ne it was not at all on my at stratosphere. It was nothing. I mean, it was just, and then starting a career on my own, knowing I had to be in front of a camera if I wanted to grow my business. 
I had to get over these fears of being in public and, and my discomfort with it, like you say. And it is a mindset shift. And it goes back to what you said before about the tools. There are tools people can learn. There are practice. Practice is important if you're nervous on stage. Yeah. To own it, to have it in your bones so that it's not something that you feel like you're out of your body doing it, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I think people people limit themselves. I hear so many people say, that's not me. I don't do that. I would never be a public figure. One of my clients said that to me the other day. And I said, that sounds like a limiting belief. <laughs> you know, like you're going to hide a little more. And, you know, what if it's not about having the light shine on you and being an egotistical leader, but being a different kind of leader? And what does that look like? Yeah, and also trying things and seeing what really works for you. Like I, I was actually really nervous about narrating the book for Audible, and it ended up being literally my absolute favorite part of the whole book process. I loved it. I loved being in the studio. I loved speaking every single word out loud, sixty all 60,000 words. <laughs> um, and maybe it's because I am more introverted there was something really nice about like being alone in the studio with my words, but I never would have guessed that if I hadn't done it, right? If I hadn't done it, I, so I've learned so much about myself in terms of going through this process, in terms of what I really enjoy doing, what I, what I don't enjoy doing as much. Um, and the stuff that I don't enjoy doing as much, what is my process for thinking through when do I say yes? Because there are times where it still might make sense to say yes, mm -hmm. right? It might just be really financially lucrative. And, and it, you know, I'll do, I'll do it three times a year for that reason, even though I don't really love it, right? But it's just being honest with yourself about um, what that process looks like for you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point because sometimes we say yes to things that aren't the most exciting, but, right. they, but they have other values that, that align with who you are. Yeah. And as long as that's not, you know, the core of what your work is that you're putting out to the world. But if it's something that's more of like an ancillary thing that you can get comfortable with doing it in, in a limited way, um, because there is some other kind of value that you're getting out of it, that's okay too. It just yeah. can't be your, can't be your, your core thing. It can't be your full-time thing if you're not right? Like if you're not getting that enjoyment out of it, then that's, I think when it becomes just so depleting, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, to visualize being happy in that, in that situation. Yeah, totally. And I think a lot of women in particular are saying yes to so many things and they're not taking care of themselves. And when you don't take care of yourself, everybody feels it. I mean, I, you know, you can't hide that when you're, when you're, snippy or you're just exhausted it's so nice to be around somebody who knows what they need and is doing it you know yeah. i love i love being around people who say i'm an on-time person i'm going to come on time or i need to meditate you know in the middle of the day so if we're together i'm going to take that time great thank you for letting amazing that, right and you know i would rather hear that all day long over i'm so busy yeah I'm like so that busy. like wearing busy like a badge of honor oh. just oh like it just really yeah. it really really irks me we're all busy we all have a lot of stuff on our plate but at the end of the day like we choose right it's it's a choice it is a choice i think what bothers me is when people come across as if this is being done to them you know like the fact that they're so busy it's like no you you're you're making these decisions about how you are going to spend your time how your kids are going to spend their time right so own it own it and somebody said to me um once you know instead of saying you're you're busy just in terms of language saying you know that you're um i can't what the words were but it was just such a, a much more beautiful way of saying busy it's like my my life is full right now or it was it was something to that effect but i've just i don't like the word busy i'm, I'm really like i'm trying to just like i'm sorry i'm trying to just like remove it you know okay so fill in the blank i used to think i wasn't blank enough i used to think i wasn't strong enough okay and what what made you know that you were stronger? 
um, just being able to have the courage to make really difficult decisions, maybe to make unpopular decisions mm -hmm. at work and um, to see the effects of those decisions, both on the business and on the team. So um, I think when I started doing that and really feeling the confidence that I, that I could do that, I realized that, that I was strong. And I also realized that you can be both nice and strong. That's the whole point in my book, right? Is that I've always been known as the nice person. Um, and there was this sort of limiting belief that being nice and being strong are mutually exclusive. They're not. You can be both. And actually, the most effective leaders lead with both qualities. Yeah, I think a lot of people think nice is weakness. And <clears throat> a lot of nice people have let people step on boundaries. And so learning to set the boundaries so that you can develop strength and all those things that we shared today about core values and not, not abandoning yourself in, in service of nice, nice attitude. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. What was the number one thing that was holding you back from becoming the woman of value you are today? The belief that I needed a big company like Time Inc. Um, to be attached to, like to be, to be successful. Like the idea of like going out on my own and really having to rely on myself like it's Fran Hauser that's the brand um, it's no more like you know picking up the phone and calling from people magazine or you know any of the, the amazing magazines that I worked with um, and knowing that I get a call back because of that affiliation so I think that that was definitely a limiting limiting belief for me it took me a while to to get past that it's something I keep hearing about time Inc and it keeps popping into my head is that you left time Inc and reclaimed your time. There's some yeah. parallel there that just yes, keeps coming up. I never thought about it that way, but <laughs> yes, absolutely. I love that. <laughs> so uh, Fran, um, what's the best advice you can give to a woman who wants to become more empowered? One thing that's been really helpful to me is, especially when I'm feeling I don't know, maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome, or I'm just not feeling as confident as I, I'd like to be feeling is um, journaling has been really helpful in terms of just writing down the different ways that I have created value or made an impact, big and small. You know, small wins are amazing. Um, and just writing those things down and being able to refer back to those things to remind yourself of what you're capable of because. Like in those moments of weakness or vulnerability, we forget, we forget what we're capable of. You know, we forget about all of the amazing things and the, the amazing work um, that, that we've done. So I think that that's just a really practical technique that's been helpful to me. I love that. I once heard from a friend to, that she kept a box with all the notes that she would receive from clients and so it was sort of a place that she would just pull things out and I started to do the same thing. Which I, I love that. And also like if you're the kind of person who really just loves keeping things on your phone, like you can take photos of those. That's right. You know, and just like keep them in an Evernote or like they just, they can always be accessible to you. Yeah, I love that. Declutter. Be yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pare it down to what's important. Pare it down. Yes, this is what the theme is here. Pare it down. And the last question I'm asking you, Fran, is how would you like to be remembered? I would love to be remembered for redefining what leadership looks like. And I'd like to be remembered for making nice a superpower. Beautiful. Thank you so much. This has just been a delightful interview. I, I love... I love your quiet, powerful leadership. Thank you. And your message is, is just so resonant with me and I'm sure with so many of the people who will be listening to this. And you not only gave practical advice, but you shared from your own life. And I think that is, is so impactful to see where you've come from and who you are today. And I'm inspired. Thank you. I feel the same, Sandy. So inspired by you. Thank you for having me. 
If you would like to step more fully into your value, grab a free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Becoming a Woman of Value on my website, thewomanofvalue.com. Just click the link at the top of the homepage. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the subscribe button in your listening app. And if there's something in this episode that inspired you, please share it with others. Because the more we share these inspirational stories, the more women of value we will have in this world. I'll see you next time.